Forbes. All right, you guys, thank you so much for coming to the uh, March 9th forum. Um, we promise this to be a very informative one. I'm certainly looking forward to it. We have from the city, the Jim Shy, he's the public works manager, and also Scott Murphy, who is the city engineer. Um, a little bit about both of them, I won't take up their time because I know you guys, they have a great presentation and you guys also have um, questions. First question that you may have is who is this person talking? My name is Phoebe Benziger and I'm one of the four, the four of four along with Barbara Bynum, Judy Files, and Kathy Hevers. And as a side note, I will say that we met last week to plan the next three months of topics of interest that Certainly we find interesting, and I can guarantee you that you will also find them very interesting. So um, just stay tuned, you can come every Wednesday morning. You, we start at eight, you're done at nine, perfect kind of meeting, and you leave well informed, and you can go to any party and start quoting off statistics and things you heard, and everybody loves a know-it-all when you walk in there. <laughs> I got this, let me tell you what's going on. So. Um, if you're not on our form list, and I would assume everybody here is on the form list, but I actually talked to someone this week who wasn't on the list, who should be, so if you know of somebody or if you're not getting your emails, please let us know after the forum. These two gentlemen will present, and at the very end, we will have you, you have the ability, as long as time permits, to ask questions. So raise your hands. Um, it's questions, not comments, although you can certainly pepper them in with positive comments. We don't really like negative comments that hurts our feelings, so we're asking you not to do that. So, um, you really do not have to drive around very far in Montrose to notice there's a lot of activity going. There's a street going in, there's a project being built, there's a project that has been built, and the city works very hard as part of their plan to do this, but the two men that are in the know are Jim Scheid and Scott Murphy. One of them, um, Jim Shai calls himself a horizontal project manager, and, and um, no, Scott, you're the horizontal guy. I did horizontal. I'm sorry. And when I talked to him, I thought that was interesting. And I didn't talk to him at the same time, the other, and then Jim goes, well, I'm the vertical. I'm the vertical project and the horizontal, so you can just picture what, what they do. Um, yeah, they've got all the questions. I've already had people ask things up here, and I've heard Scott say, I will address that. So just sit tight and be prepared. Um, it's a great place to live in the city of Montrose and I can guarantee you, you will leave, leave feeling that way. So it's gonna start with Jim, who is actually a Montrose High School graduate. He graduated from Montrose High School. He's been with the city about four plus years, two kids in elementary school. Scott Murphy has been in this, with the city for 10 years? Yeah. 10 years-ish. Um, he just had a new baby this year. I'm on the planning commission, so when we had the Zoom calls, there were times that Scott would come up on the screen holding a newborn. And I thought, isn't that the coolest thing? Um, so, yeah, they multitask as, as well as anybody. So I'll turn it over to Jim, who will start, and then he'll, and Scott will go to second. So, thank you. Good morning. Steve said I'm our public works manager, um, which means I oversee parks and streets, our fleet and facilities, and trash recycle division. Um, but I also manage some of our capital projects, and we call it the vertical projects, or, or what that means is when we're building walls, something. Is that better? Um, so in vertical sense, I mean a, a building of sorts, so related to facilities, because that's one of the divisions I manage. Um, when we're building a restroom or a new police department, for that matter, that's where um, I would come in and manage a project where horizontal is streets and something flat. And that's what Scott does. So, with that, today we'll talk about a few of those um, capital projects, um, both from ones I'm managing and Scott. Um, and here's, here's a few that I'll be talking about today. The, uh, Public Safety Complex, the new police department down south first. Uh, new irrigation system in Buckley Lions Park. Um, a new restroom on our Connect Trail. We find the signage, solar lights that you'll see in our parks. And um, our City of Montrose Streets Crew asphalt maintenance plan for the year. 
So we'll start off with the uh, public safety complex. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with Blaine Hall, our police chief, and the commanders, Matt Smith, Tim Cox. Um, it's, been, it's been really impressive to work with these guys. They do so much. And you know, I've spent my, most of my life trying to stay out of the police department. <laughs> and now, I've been in it and see their operation and understand a lot of it now. It's uh, again quite impressive. So um, it's been it's been a, a fun project so far, and we we really started back in 2019 when none of us really knew how to build a police department. Um, we went to train um, to kind of get caught up with the rest of the country and how police departments are built, what they cost, um, things like that, and that that was 2019. So we're that was early stages of the project and putting estimates to it, and now um, we're, where we're at today. You can see it's uh, well underway. Um, this picture was from 2020. Um, first day of demo of one of the buildings that was on the site where the new PD is at now. And Blaine took the first swipe out of the building with the tobacco. So uh, I'll never forget that smile. I don't know if you can see it from there. But, I mean, a smile is year to year. Um, this picture I actually showed last year here at Forum was the stair tower um, and kind of pile cap stage of the project um, early on. So I don't kind of even recognize that anymore now. Um, but this was last June um, on the public safety complex project. So um, the stuff we'll never see again. So all is buried in concrete and steel. So this is a. Um, graphic I like to show. Um, so on the top there you have, um, you know, witch sticks, old guy with sticks, uh, dowsing rods, another old dude trying to find water, and then you have contractors on a Friday afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> it's, you know, after a certain amount of time, after a stressful situation, you can laugh about it. So I'm trying to put this up here so I can laugh about it. Um, because early stages of the police department project, we found a couple water lines that weren't supposed to be there. Um, sewer lines that were not there. Um, and so those things are um, difficult to laugh about at the time, but you know, a year later, you can put a, you know, open make a joke about it. Um, I think Scott could probably use this same slide a year from now about the Townsend project, but it's not funny right, it's not funny right now. <laughs> no. Um, but actually what we did learn from some of those issues is the importance of as-built and GIS location of utilities. Um, when those were installed in the past, that wasn't done, and that's why we're having issues now. Sorry. Um, so with this new project, obviously, as-built and GIS location is very important, and every utility is documented in those ways so that in the future, if we ever have to dig anything up, we are not finding them the hard way. <laughs> In a couple progress photos, so this was related to steel. The top picture there is the first beam that was placed, and the lower picture is the last one. So this was our topping out uh, party um, celebration of uh, flying the last piece of steel, the highest one on the building. Here are a couple current pictures, um, mainly showing where we're at with facades. So you can see the. Um, brick is obviously going up. The top picture is on the west side of the building. Um, some glazing going in there as well, but nearly finished with the brick facade on this side. Uh, the lower picture is on the east. Um, Roman numerals across the front of the building. You may not be able to see the picture here, but um, those spell out 1882, which is the year Montrose was founded. Um, ongoing in the project right now um, is Glazing, so we're installing a lot of windows right now, storefront, um, paint on the interior, mechanical systems are being finished out, flooring, so um, getting into the final stages of construction. Um, definitely all of the structure and most of the exterior is complete now. And I don't know if you saw it, but the RTUs were flown onto the building this week. That was quite impressive. Two very large air handling units were placed um, you guys like me, that was kind of cool to watch. Very large crane flying, a huge piece of equipment on the building. So a couple stats um, and a rendering. The picture here in the bottom is what the building 
um, will look like when completed. Um, so this project, a big push for us was local involvement. And through design and procurement of construction, we really pushed on getting local contractors involved in the project. And with, out of about 80 people on site, and that varies every day, but approximately 80 um, contractors working on site each day, uh, about 70% of those are from the Western Slope. So that's, uh, for a project of this size, that's successful, I think. Um, we really push for that, and I think our contractor in this case is Shaw. They've done a good job of working with local contractors to uh, maybe if they didn't have the capacity for this project and working with them to find a way that they could work with others on the project or get them involved. Um, that also comes out to um, local expenditures in um, vendors, supplies, hotels, things like that. Um, as of last month, uh, we're at about $2.5 million spent here in Montrose on, at vendors, suppliers, things like that. That doesn't include labor, so that's a um, that's a large number to, to put into the vendors here in Montrose. Uh, and then obviously we're not done yet, there will be several more months to go. Um, BIM modeling, and I, it's building, building information modeling for modeling. Is a uh, um, utilize on this project is something they use on lots of large scale commercial projects. Um, in this case, it was used probably even more extensively than I've seen in the past, and it really helps with the mechanical systems, electrical systems, to get them to coordinate with each other so that they're not having conflicts in the field and that they look nice um, as far as exposed, um, that they're not having to go around each other and things like that. Um, makes the installation much more efficient when you have a, a model plan. That way everybody knows at what layer they're installing their, um, their trade. And um, this building, we uh, use that extensively. It was, um, even when they were framing walls, they were framing in blockouts for mechanical systems to go through. They were able to prefab a lot of their transitions in the shop rather than forming them in the field uh, because of that modeling. And actually this project is being used as an example for that extensive BIM modeling for BIM um, for other projects of this size that are being designed right now. Um, and it is on schedule for completion in August of this year. So, um, doing well. <coughs> on to uh, irrigation. Um, so this is an irrigation system replacement in Buckley and Lyons Park. And this location is North 1st to North 7th right off Nevada. Um, there's actually two systems there now, um, both of which are failing. Um, they are nearly falling into the Montrose Arroyo, um, and we have many zones that are um, more than problematic for us to keep going. So we designed this last year, we started a new system, and are installing this year. Um, seems simple irrigation system, but it is actually very complex. This system in area is about the same as Cerise Park, it's about 10 acres, um, but in, in the layout and how the system will work is much more complex. Cerise is a large open square field where this has hundreds of existing trees and is in a layout that doesn't lend itself to a normal irrigation system. So it's a very complex project um, that we'll be installing um, a portion of this spring and then another, uh, the remaining portion this fall after our irrigation season is over. Um, there will be some impact to trees in the park. Um, we again tried to design around that as much as we could, but there will be some trees removed because of this project, and because of that, our parks department will be replacing those trees over the next coming years. And this is just a picture of the design of the, the system, again, trying to emphasize the complexity. It, it, uh, Took us a year to come up with this design. That's uh, how much thought went into this. Go on to the uh, North Connect Trail <coughs> restroom project. So this is our rendering, um, obviously without color. Um, it was meant to be simple and um, basic, trying to keep costs as low as possible, but also to match the buildings surrounding it. So a lot of the color schemes on this will actually match the Colorado Yurt building, and I'll, I'll show why that's important here in a minute. In a minute. But um, CMU block and metal um, siding will be basically the finish on the outside of it. So this was a partnership with Colorado Yurt um, in that the city is building the restroom, 
um, and maintaining it, where RAR donated the property that the uh, building is on, and also contributed towards the construction of the project to pay for um, a shower portion of the building. I'll, I'll explain more later. Um, this shows the location a little bit better. So in Colorado Outdoors, north of town, off uh, Grand Avenue is this road here, Mayfly Drive, this one, and the new Colorado Yurt Building is being built right here. Flex buildings are right here. Um, so right behind them, along the connect trail is where this restaurant is. Um, it's on a very small piece um, behind the parking lot of Colorado Yurt, right, right on the trail. Um, the, this may explain it. So the layout of this is that the restroom side of it, which is the front of the building here, this is open to the public as any other public restroom would be during park hours. The back portion of the building is showers for Colorado Yurt users to use um, as they stay in the yurt or other things at the building. Um, so it's, it's a, that's how it's a shared partnership of the building where the city built it, Colorado Yurt paid for their portion of the project. Wayfinding signs is another thing to look for uh, coming this year. Um, mainly, uh, one of the main focuses for 2022 is parking lots. So putting up new and identifiable parking lot signage. Because there's actually quite a few public parking lots downtown that are unknown. Um, and they're just not identified very well. They may be in kind of a weird spot, so it's kind of hard to find. But with signage, we think they'll be, they'll be able to recognize them easier. And then some directional signage kind of pointing you to what direction uh, the parking lots may be. So that's one, one piece of our wayfinding project this year. Um, there'll be others like um, we've seen probably some of our large boulder um, signs that we have, the water sports park or uh, the amphitheater, things like that. Uh, we're doing one of those up at the Ciro Summit uh, for the park that's up there. Um, there'll be a couple of visitor kiosks installed downtown and then, and then finishing up some of the larger uh, wayfinding signs you see along the streets. Um, for 2023 wayfinding, um, look for trail signage. So we'll be doing trail maps and, and uh, um, trails um, as part of 2023. Solar lights. So we have um, some existing now. We, we did a uh, pilot test for these in Rotary Park. Worked very well, so we've continued doing that. Um, we have some in Rotary Park, and we have some in La Raza. Um, and we will be continuing uh, with Rotary Park and with Tabwash this year um, with several new um, solar lights. And so why do we go with the solar light? Well, the upfront cost and the lifespan of the solar light is about the same as a traditional light. And the where we have the most savings in it, though, is the maintenance because the electrical systems that ran like a rotary park um, lights was in horrible shape. It, it really needed replaced throughout. We, we mandated it for years and it took a lot of time and a lot of money to keep that system alive where it really needed a full scale replacement of the electrical system which would have been by far more expensive than the lights themselves. So the solar lights, obviously there is no electrical infrastructure and therefore our maintenance on that is none. Um, and then, of course, the cost of electricity. Um, we don't often have to pay for electricity with these. Um, but really, the real savings comes in the um, maintenance related to electrical infrastructure. Potholes. So <laughs> we were asked to come speak here at Forum in March, um, which really doesn't matter the topic. I knew we were going to talk about potholes. So, but potholes are actually very related to capital projects. Um, specifically, our street improvements and the street uh, preparation for those street improvements. Um, so a pothole repair is a temporary fix to a larger problem. Um, it's a band-aid, really. And in March, that band-aid falls off very quickly. So what are we doing long-term and short-term for potholes? I'll get into that. Um, but um, I would like to mention using the uh, Better Montrose app for requests when it comes to potholes. That is the quickest way for us to get those into our crews and get them addressed. Um, you can always call Public Works or email any one of us. I have cards with me today if, um, if apps aren't your thing. But 
the app is the best way, or the quickest way, I would say, for us to be able to get our crews to address problems that we may not have seen. So this map, this is our eight-year plan, and um, basically what it is, it just divides the city into eight different sections, all with very similar lane miles. And it is our year-to-year -year plan to address patching, crack sealing, and street improvements. So the city of Montrose crews are doing the short-term work in patching and crack sealing, which is preparing the streets for a larger fix in a street improvement. So how it works is the city crews will be patching roads in this light green area this year, 2022. And when I say patching, I mean cutting out a section of road that may be have a depression in it or alligator cracking or even a pothole. And they'll cut out a piece that is anywhere from three feet by three feet to 10 feet by 40 feet. So you'll see a large square cut out of the road, the base repaired and then the asphalt replaced in that section. And that basically sets up an area that fixes those areas that are that are failing to be set up for crack seal the following year. So in 2023, we will be crack sealing the same area. So again, patching prepares the area for crack sealing, crack sealing comes in 23, and then that area is what I would call then eligible for a street improvement project and could be proposed in 2024. And so we follow this map in um, for what Type of process we're doing again in 20, 2023. We'll be patching this area and we will be crack sealing this area because we patched it last year. Um, crack sealing, so last year in 2021, we did 120,000 pounds of crack sealing in-house of our own crews. So 120,000 pounds. And I've said it before, I'll probably say it again, that's a lot of crack. <laughs> and unlike our police department, which is taking crack off the streets, we are filling it with black sticky goo. Um, so anyway, that sets up the air for the, for the real fix, um, the real pothole repair, which is a street improvement project. And those are generally contracted out. So those are slurry or cape seals, mill and overlays, uh, complete rebuild. And we have labeled these street improvement projects uh, a move mode. And this is where I hand it off to Scott. Um, our public works team kind of prepares the streets for a, uh, a street improvement project and then we shovel it on to engineering. Um, and so I'm gonna do the same right now. I'm gonna <laughs> shovel it off to, to engineering. <laughs> Jim. Um, so my part, I'll start with, uh, yeah, the contractor street maintenance. So um, like I said, anything we can do in-house, kind of the base flow, uh, the street crews are doing, and then the larger projects that either have specialized equipment or are just beyond the abilities of our uh, team to do from a labor standpoint, um, gets contracted. And that's, that's where I come in. Um, so we have branded a lot of that as moving mantras forward. Um, you've seen this sign probably around town. And that's our webpage, movemo.co. Um, and that's where you can go to get a lot of information on our capital plans, um, product updates as things are going on, road closures, things of that sort. You can set it up so it'll give you notifications also. Um, we try and keep it updated. Um, sometimes Barbara reminds me like, hey, this is getting away. So um, <laughs> thanks Barbara, that's very helpful actually because she gets questioned and she looks and oh, that's not there. So we get very busy and you know, webmaster becomes part of part of our job also. So, um, so if something's missing, feel free to call us also. But, um, so I'll hit on that, and then I'll talk about a couple of leftovers from 2021. Um, usually we don't have projects carry over. Uh, 2021 was a lot more difficult than 2020. I think um, a lot of the labor issues and supply chain issues became more apparent in 2021. Um, and outsider stuff that was just playing out of our control that I'll go into. Um, uh, for that have driven some of those projects carrying over. Um, they're pretty close, but uh, I'll go into the, the story on those so you guys really know on that. And then I'll go into some of the projects, uh, larger capital projects that we have going on this year. Um, all in total about, and new projects for 2022, about 10 million in uh, horizontal projects. Um, so going into the street maintenance, so 
this, you know, from Jim's map, it was the plan for the whole town. This is the plan for 2022. Um, so you'll see uh, so the red areas are a lot of surface treatments. I call it road sunscreen. Um, you know, a lot of the residential areas and whatnot, they, they don't get a lot of loading, but they just sit there and they get old and they get brittle. The sun wears them down and we got to count. Um, the old way to do that was uh, chip seals. Everybody hates chip seals. Um, so you'll see kind of a more modern version of that or slurry seals, which I'll show a picture up here in a minute. Um, we also have some rebuilds, some overlays, um, and mill overlays. Um, and we try and find a balance between, we try and hit you know, all portions of town so that um, uh, you know, we're not just focusing on a certain area that, you know, the general adage in, in uh, street maintenance is keep the good roads good. It's like paint your house before you have to replace your siding. Um, that's great, but if we did that, you know, we're far enough behind um, that we would only be focusing in a certain area of town. So we do have to spread the load, uh, find a balance between keeping the good roads good, but also repairing some of those that have gone bad. Um, so that's why you see kind of a balance between surface treatments and rebuilds. Um, slurry seals are something we've been utilizing a lot lately. Um, specialty contractors come in with their little slurry truck here. And this is a picture from last year. I think this was an American village. Um, you might notice. So it's a it's not an overlay, it's not asphalt, it's just a, it's a step up from a chip seal that gets the road covered, um, helps with some of that oxidation, uh, keeps it from getting brittle because uh, if left to its own, it just kind of unravels and slowly gets just nastier and nastier as the sun breaks it down and the asphalt within the, within the road breaks down. So um, you'll see more of these this year. Um, the nice part about these is they're usually in and out in a day or two and uh, um, pretty low invasive and you don't get rocks in your windshield, which is obviously um, not to say we won't do some chip seals on um, some of our minor arterials that have the heavier traffic load, um, but we always cap those with a slurry after. So if we have to live with a chip seal, it's only for a couple weeks. And then what everybody came here to talk about, the Woodgate realignment. Um, so this is Old Grove, the bottom of the picture, or the bottom of the picture here. You know, right now, all the traffic funnels and there's this pretty big bottleneck. Um, if anybody's tried to navigate it, it's still alive. Good job. Um, where you got crisscrossing, um, and everybody that's trying to avoid Townsend by using Hillcrest north south, you know, because it doesn't go through Vista San Juan, they end up either cutting through Vista San Juan, which is a problem, or end up kind of contributing to this bottleneck on Townsend, which we're only as good as our best bottleneck. So, what this does is allows a lot of that traffic that's looking to avoid Townsend to come down Oak Grove and then get to Woodgate without having to go on to Townsend. Um, the problem is there's a couple cabinets here. I'll show a picture of them in a way. Um, that's its own story. But um, right now we, we were pretty excited. We got a land deal that we've been working on. I think the city's been trying for 10 years or so. We finally had a breakthrough a couple years ago. Got everything worked out to purchase the land we needed to get the road built. You know, long term this will be a roundabout. Um, it's not really right for it yet. We don't have all the land. So um, we're building the, this is a three way for now. And we'll have a follow up project to bring a roundabout in here. Um, and so yeah, so working on the design, we engaged, uh, we don't name any names um, of the utility companies, um, but that feeling you get when you call the utility company and you get stuck on hold and you feel like nobody's listening and you're really frustrated. So that's like two years we've been doing that for these guys. Uh, this was taken a couple days ago. Um, the new road will run along here. You can see the edge of the road will be here. Um, we have a quarter of the town running through these boxes right here. Um, we do that obviously through design, engage them. Um, they've had the plans and we've been working with them for about two years now. Um, call it COVID, call it all the wildfires, you know, they had to go put two cell towers and fiber stuff, whatever, you know, they had, they had every excuse in the book, but at the end of the day, it's kind of out of our control. It's, it's not a city utility, they're third party communications utilities. We're relying on them to get them out of the way. Um, the good news is uh, they're finally getting them out of the way. So. Um, it's about, I think all in all, with every connection, about 10,000 wires places um, that have to be done. So it's just three months of just putting wires together. Um, and uh, yeah, so um, they've been good to work with, just they just don't show up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> could be worse, they could be mean and not show up. Um, so uh, we're poised, we didn't want to close, you know, there's still work we could do in, in Old Woodgate to get some of the utility work finished, but we didn't want to close Old Woodgate and then be waiting on this. 
Um, as you can imagine, the detour and all the shortcutting through Vista San Juan that'll happen once this is closed. So we really want to make sure that these are gone before we pull the lever on that, um, just so we don't end up with a detour for eight months and gravel roads and, and the mess that come with that. So um, uh, we've done everything we can do to get to you know that point. Um, this is just the first lift of asphalt, so when we do the final one, it'll all be nice and clean and, and run through the whole thing. Um, and this land on each side remains private land, um, so no plans for that yet. Um, uh, but eventually, you know, we probably likely see commercial development there. Um, another carryover from 21. Uh, the city partnered with a private developer. They're building 96 apartment units in Colorado outdoors. Uh, this is a picture of their construction last week. Um, the first building's onto its third floor. That's the size of the building, three-story buildings. Um, to help facilitate housing, anybody who's ever tried to buy a house around here right now or have someone find a rental, it's pretty much impossible. Um, so the city's trying to help um, ease that, or fix that problem for our community because we need housing to make everything else work. Um, we did some of the infrastructure work to support this. Um, similar deal, there's this little block that's, we got the regular retaining wall blocks, but there's this fancy block that has two sides to it that for some reason, I guess it's harder to ship and make. Been on order for a year um, and didn't let us finish the street going down into it. So as soon as those blocks show up, the city will be paving that street. Um, and uh, and yeah, you can call and yell at them. And then they put you at the bottom of the list. And, you know, try a different tank. Um, Sunset Mesa tank, so everything is built. Uh, the tank is obviously built. Um, this is a picture from the pump house. It's a two-story pump house. Um, uh, but we're missing a pump, um, which is pretty important to the operation. Um, this is Jim's joke, so I can't claim it, but we think that pump is right here. <laughs> and last time I heard, they got that thing free, but then they're wholly in port until they pay their fines. Uh, our pump is with it. Right? It's the only explanation I can come up with. Um, so, yeah, so it's not in service yet. Because everything's built. Four bolts and a pump, and we'll be there, but we don't have a pump. Um, kind of interesting picture. This is the old, um, the old tank. Um, so uh, it came down really easy. Uh, uh, it was it was due. Um, it actually took about 45 minutes to demo. It was pretty spread. Um So we'll get this hole filled over the next couple of years, just as we have waste soils coming off of projects. We'll get this filled um, because eventually the road that goes over um, Sunset Mesa will likely pass right through here. Um, and so kind of planning for the future there. Uh, now we get going to 22. <laughs> was, 2020 was a, is, I mean, it's, it's crazy how much patience required to uh, just manage things that are completely out of our control because it's frustrating. You know, everybody's frustrated and wanted to get those projects done. Um, we have, but 22 is off to a much better start. Um, we have materials for a lot of this year's projects. We were, a lot of we saw some of these issues coming, we ordered the materials uh, way ahead of time knowing what was coming. And, and so far, 2022 is tracking better. Um, first project for 22 is a bridge replacement. Um, this is over the Lutzen Hazard Canal by the city's golf course on Burke Street. Um, it was, it might have had a couple days left in its life before it was, it was about to go. So we, we maximized the old bridge for everything we could and are constructing this new one. This should be wrapped up in a couple days and ready for the water to come on on the Lutzen Hazard Canal. Um, Townsend. Um, so the good news, um, CDOT is uh, planning a mill and overlay of all of town, um, through town. Um, it's going to be an epic project for our city. I mean, everyone's driven out towns and it's in pretty rough shape. Um, even just the aesthetics of it, not to mention the drive quality that's going to come because your life will do it better if you're not dodging potholes. But um, so Townsend Avenue is a CDOT highway, so they take care of the major structural maintenance. Um, so they'll be doing a mill and overlay of the whole thing. Um, in anticipation of that, we didn't want to, uh, we want to fix two problems. One, just about every manhole in Townsend is kind of sunken in. Um, that's a product of, you know, things settle and move over time, um, but also at, you know, 15 to 20,000 vehicles a day, uh, those manholes structurally start wallowing out and the frames end up uh, deforming and getting even lower. Um, so we're going to go through and reset every single one of those concurrent with their project. Um, about a quarter inch below uh, the pavement, so they're nice and flush. And we're putting in a, a, a replaceable frame that, so in the future, as they do break down, they can be replaced without having to do asphalt work. Um, so it allows us to adjust those a lot more easily, whereas now you have to dig up the whole frame and 
and shim it, and it's pretty invasive. So that's the one I'm most excited about. Um, you know, as fun as it is to you know, teach you white to dog, pot or to dog <laughs> manholes, um, you don't have to do that anymore. Um, and then the other piece is the waterline project. So um, from South Fifth, actually the Elk Grove, there's old lines, but we've had the worst problems from South Fifth to South Twelfth. Um, water lines that are 40s to 50s, yeah, right in front of you. Yep, 40s to 50s era. Um, so many skeletons. It's been unreal. The things we have, not physical skeletons, but um, <laughs> thank you. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, just the history of the way the town has developed. We have, you know, water systems that are 50 to 70 years old. Um, so some of the valve, a lot of valving doesn't work, so shutting down the tie in is, is problematic. Um, there's unknown connections throughout all of it. Um, unknown locations that ma maps weren't invented, I guess, in the 40s. Um, uh, unknown connections, so you have, if you dig along, you find this water line that feeds, and is a duplicate line to the line we thought was there that feeds, you know, neighborhood three blocks that way. Um, unknown connections, unknown back feeds. So if you're trying to shut down a line, you have another area that's back pressuring into it, and you have no idea how do you find it. You have no idea that it's there. Um, so if you've seen us, you know, out there swimming, um, that's some of the problems we're encountering. Um, I think we're over the hump. We're on to the final stages now where we're boring across and doing the final tie-ins, all the mainline stuff, north-south stuff is done. Um, so I, I think we're getting there. Um, again, this, this is all done in anticipation. We didn't want to have an overlay project and then have to tear up a brand new street that first week, you know, because that's Murphy's Law. Um, and so we'll patch, we will patch, I didn't even mean to make this, we will patch, um, we will get this patched um, and kind of buttoned up at the end of ours and then CDOT will come in for their project. Um, they'll be in there all summer, um, they're primarily working nights um, because the traffic is heavier in the summer. Um, so uh, hopefully, and yeah, we finally got a nice week last week so a lot of those potholes we were able to fill and actually stick, but we're out there literally every single day trying to, to stay ahead of those. Um, you know, in front of uh, O'Reilly's, there's holes that just go across the road. <laughs> you're wondering, why are we making crop circles in the highway? Um, it's trying to find the line. So, you know, just think it's here, there's a valve here, there's a valve here, there's no line, and it's doing this number. They didn't have tracing wire back in the day, so <laughs> it's fun. I like it. <laughs> um, if you've been over on the east side of town, uh, you'll notice there's a lot of housing going in over here. It's kind of our probably next biggest growth area that we're seeing. Um, this is a picture from our comp plan, so it outlines all the kind of master road network. Um, the county's also working on theirs and mesh them together. But uh, um, at Hill Street, it is a minor arterial, so um, we have 6700 Road, which I'll talk about here in a minute. Um, but second to that, we have Hill Street, which is our next kind of minor arterial. Um, right now it stops between Niagara and Sunnyside, so this project will take it up to Sunnyside. Um, this is adjacent to some residential development, so we're always looking for two firs or three firs in our project. In this case, you know, we're helping support housing, helping get this minor arterial built through, and we also have a big waterline project that needed to go through there that I'll talk about. So um, that one should be online uh, June of this year. They start in a couple weeks. Um, adjacent, or down that same alignment, we're putting in a 24-inch HDPE water line. Um, so over the last couple of years, we've been working as growth continues, water demands continue. So um, both, uh, you know, more demand um, with drought and people watering their yards more, but also more people. So that's driving more and more demand. Um, we need to make sure all of our tanks, or sorry, Sunset Mesa, our eastern tanks are up along the eastern edges of town, and we need to be able to keep really good hydraulic capacity to those to keep those full. Um, so that when there's demands or peak demands or a fire, those tanks are full and ready to go. Um, but also that we have good flow through on those two to keep water quality up. Um, so that's what this product is doing. So it's, we don't really have a problem with um, maintaining water pressures or anything, um, but we would if we don't stay ahead of it. So this is a master plan capital project, uh, about three million bucks to run a 24 inch water line um, where we left off a couple of the projects two years ago um, to get from 6800 and Sunnyside down to 6700 and East Oak Road. Um, there's a pump station down there. Um, so you'll see, uh, originally they were gonna do it in the fall, but now they're gonna try and get done in the spring window. Um, right now they're going through Fox Park. Um, they're trying to get that restored before the park season. Um, and then you'll see them in Hill Street, the paved portions of Hill Street, Niagara, um, after that, and then we'll finish up at the south end. Um, this product will probably, might be done um, this winter. 
um, it might spill early in the, or into a portion of 2023. Um, they're running ahead of schedule, so it might get left up this year. But pretty cool project. So this is this is 24 inch HDPE pipe. Um, comes in 50 foot sticks. This is a fusion machine. Um, this is probably a you know, 150 year pipeline. The idea is they have to touch it, size it once, do it right, do it once, and uh, they fuse it up on the ground and kind of string it down into the pipe, which you can imagine um, with all the utilities in the way can get pretty fun. Uh, again, we like a challenge. Um, and then another one happening, this is uh, this project being spearheaded by the county. Um, thanks for being here. Uh, the signal at Chapita at US 550. So um, continue to grow up down there and then kind of the straw that broke the camel's back on it was the uh, hub project helped kind of facilitate um, uh, putting it. It was getting close to meeting warrants. With that project, it finally met warrants to see it all allow us to put in a signal. Um, so the city and county are partnering to put in a signal at Chapita. And that should be started here this fall. We're currently on track uh, once we get through all our clearances with CDOT. And uh, um, that's a process in itself. Um, I'll talk a little bit about design. I want to talk a little bit about water. because Everybody likes to talk about water, and water is a big deal. Um, so the next big, or the next uh, roundabout project will be Niagara and Hillcrest. We're working on the design for that this year. Um, there's a couple of pieces of property we'll need to buy to get enough right away for that, or a couple portions of property we'll have to buy. Um, so getting the design done for that so we're ready for construction in the next you know, two to five years. Um, we got $2 million from West Main. This is a picture of West Main here. Um, to, they call it a West Main Revi or they call it revitalization grant from CDOT. Um, it's focused on uh, sprucing it up. So finding a good balance point between traffic, pedestrians, bicycles, and business friendliness. Um, we don't know what that template's gonna be like, so we'll do a lot of studies, a lot of alternative uh, evaluations, public outreach, and see what we wanna do with West Main. Um, but I think we can all agree, if you're on a wheelchair and you want to walk down that little hyperscopic sidewalk, it's not a good thing. So um, we're very excited to get the pedestrian connectivity through the area, uh, especially with you know the growth of the Connect Trail, West Main Trail, and all that. So um, that's just design we're working on this year. Construction will probably start in the middle of 23. Um, you guys have noticed there's a little bit of traffic growth in town. Um, uh, trying to hit and stay ahead of um, kind of the intersection capacity issues that are likely to come as, as Townsend continues to see pressure. So we're working on alternate routes to Townsend to keep some of that pressure off of Townsend, um, but also, um, you know, you know Og, the, the good examples are Ogden, um, East Oak Grove, South Fifth. Um, you have some misaligned intersections, don't have turn lanes. Um, just, we're gonna start running into capacity issues. So we wanna get master planning done on that so that, you know, as CDOT works on um, things and grant opportunities come around, um, we can get the land secured now, get plans on the shelf so that we can start getting some of those intersections improved. Um, we're also working on the design. Um, the reason 6700 doesn't, there's a gap in it between Sunnyside and Miami is um, there's land in there that the city doesn't own. Um, we're working with the owners on that to purchase what we need for the right of way. And I think we've had a good breakthrough on that. It, it should be coming together hopefully here in the next two to three months. Um, that'll allow us to get the design ready and that would likely go to construction in 23, if all goes well. And then water resources. So um, part of our job is, you know, we manage capital projects, uh, development infrastructure, and uh, stormwater and water resources are kind of the main parts of my job. Um, our water resources are good. Our um, predecessors have set us up really well. We're using about half of our portfolio and the water resources we do have are relatively stable. Um, that being said, the Colorado River is in, which we are tributary to, is in really bad shape. Um, they like Powell is hitting crisis level, I think, this week, at elevation 35, 25. Um, it's unprecedented territory for, you know, the law of the river and the Colorado River system. So we don't know what the future holds. Um, you know, at the federal level, locally, we're, we're fine and we're great, but we want to make sure that it stays that way. Um, water is extremely important to our quality of life and our agriculture and you know, everything we do here. Um, so we're doing a, you know, now we know, kind of we know we have new technologies um, with our automated, meter, automated, automated metering systems with our um, residential water use to do really detailed demand forecasts for build out of our, our water district. Um, we have a defined water district that eventually 
Um, you know, the city montrose would be full, and then anything that happens in the peripherals would be Tri County's water district or other water districts. But um, we want to make sure that we're good stewards of it. We kind of want to create a good culture of water use. So, you know, the days of just covering your lawn with grass just because that's what you do, or I think, are, are going away, and we want to help foster better, smarter use of our water through various things. Our own internal operations, switching over to irrigation when possible, um, not having non-essential turf, um, but also land use codes that help help us stretch our water resources as far as we can while maintaining that quality of life that we all love. So, um, I could talk about water for days. Um, if anybody wants to talk about it, we'll talk about it, give me a call. Um, and then uh, the next product that's also in the hopper is this county is working on design of a signal at the Montrose Airport to kind of go concurrent with their terminal expansion. It involves the railroad, which that's its own animal. Uh, we're helping, in the name of tourism, we're, help, we're helping fund that project, so we'll be contributing one and a half million to that construction once they get there. Um, my guess is construction will probably be 2023, um, maybe 24, depending on how the railroad stuff goes. And leave a little bit of time for questions here. So I just showed the slide, because this is out of our um, capital plan, and people like to talk about future projects and what's gonna happen when and what they cost. Um, so on this slide, this is kind of a lot of what's in the hopper, as we know it. You know, there's $60 million of projects on here. Um, most of these are street projects. So on the street world, we spend three to five a year, maybe two to three, depending on the year, on you know, capital arterial extension. So you can imagine this is a, this is a pretty big elephant to eat um, over time. But um, you know, a lot of ones you hear about Rio Grande extension, we've made really good headway on securing the rights away for that. We're down to two property owners, one of them being the railroad. Uh, to finish that project. I don't, get, I don't get too excited about the railroad coming through, but um, we've gotten three, or secured three more properties of right away over the last two years. So we're getting closer on having a bypass on the west side, or an alternate to Townsend on the west side. Um, obviously with the Hillcrest extension, or realignment done, you have a, in the South Hillcrest extension, you do have a full north-south alternate to Townsend. Um, and then with 6700 punching through, um, you know, that'll likely prompt the signal at 6700 here and the extension of East Oak Road through the bridges, um, which has part, been part of their master plan all along. Um, so then you have a second alternate to town. Um, so you're starting to get these good north-south corridors, which help keep pressure and keep, you know, all this through traffic clogging up the rest of the, the east-west roads. Um, you know, Ogden has always been a tall order. You know, we, there's like 22 properties we'd have to acquire to get Ogden wide. So, yeah. There's some development that is occurring that might help it start incrementally getting done. Um, so we're hopeful there. Um, obviously the roundabout we'll be doing. Um, you know, once this corridor's roundabouts are done, the next likely place to go will be the 6700 corridor, probably starting with the Niagara roundabout. Um, so no shortage of projects. I think park will probably happen in the next couple of years. Um, finally reconstruct North Park, get rid of some of those horrible grounds and, and drop offs all of that. So I'll leave this one up because that's what people usually like to ask questions about. And it's a good place to point to. So um, with that, if you got questions for either Jim or I, happy to. So. Thank you. Can you hear this okay? Uh, my question is for Scott, and it concerns the southeast corner of Townsend and Fifth Street. Uh, is there thoughts to sort of making a right turn lane? That's a very tight corner that turns on to uh, Fifth Street. Yeah, so that's one of the ones that when I talk about the intersection capacity studies that we wanted to evaluate. So what they'll do in those studies is um, take current counts. Actually, we have actually already taken the counts. Um, uh, and then they project out into the planning horizon, which is usually about 2045 at this point, and say, so, you know, when does it start breaking down? When do you need to start needing your auxiliary turn lanes? That may be now. Um, from that plan, we get a kind of footprint of what the intersection needs to look like and, and when. So, you know, that, do we need to add that turn lane now or do we need to add that turn lane in 10 years? Those kinds of things. And we can start working on property purchases because a lot of times we're right of way constrained. Um, we'll start um, trying to work with landowners to buy those properties. Um, a lot of times they're willing to sell. Um, we pay pretty good for it. Um, if they don't, we do have to go to eminent domain, but we can't do that until we're shovel ready. And so that, you know, timelines can get kind of sideways there, but uh, um, but that is one of the intersections, and that's exactly the kind of things we look at um, to um, make sure we can try and get ahead of those things. 
upon all these others. <laughs> so funding also comes into play um, of what we can what we can buy off each year. Yeah, Scott, I, I really appreciate the uh, cooperation that the city and the county are doing, uh, particularly with the Chapita signal and the signalized uh, thing at the uh, at the airport. Um, the question I have is that uh, <clears throat> this has to deal with Chapita. And the city has annexed uh, a lot of uh, that area down there by Cobble Creek, going all the way down to Racine. I don't know if people know that. And then we have the Hub Project. And Chapita is also a de facto uh, truck route for all the gravel trucks and so forth that, that come down through there. And I was just wondering if there's any uh, uh, looking at uh, the city taking over Chapita or partnering with the county to, to upgrade that. Because that's, I mean, right now it's it's uh, really kind of a dangerous dangerous area to, to negotiate, not only for vehicles, but pedestrians and cyclists. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, right now, yeah, all of Chapita remains as, as county right of way. I think the eventual um, likely outcome is to be a partnership. Um, Cause there's portions of Chapita that don't make sense for the city to take over. Um, and, um, you know, we, yeah, there's city roads, there's county roads, we both take care of them, but it's all the same community. So, um, you know, likely the next thing that'll happen on Chapita would be a partnership project at some point. Um, dollar wise and priority wise, so we, volume, you know, it's able to handle the volume. Um, we don't have a lot of safety. We've done some, a lot of research with, you know, a lot of stuff that came up with the hub. There weren't a lot of safety issues on Chapita proper. The intersection had higher than average um, safety instances, and that's what kind of helped drive the signalized project. Um, so for now, it's it's a want um, to do that, because um, we obviously want help pedestrian connectivity. We've got the right trail going through there. Um, one thing we're looking at doing as an interim measure is uh, getting a trail connection uh, that, that we built uh, with City Cruise in 23 um, between Cobble Drive and the Rec Trail. So at least that population center has a safe way to get to the Rec Trail without having to try and walk along the you know shoulder of Chapita. So um, we're trying to do what we can with funds available in the interim. And then long range, obviously, Chapita will be built as a, a larger minor arterial with bike lanes and turn lanes and everything. Um, but I mean, realistically, funding wise, my guess is that's a ways out. But you know, a lot of other. We look, you know, when we prioritize products, we're looking at, you know, volumes, capacities, and safety. And, um, you know, even within our interior city road network, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot to, there's a lot to eat out there. <laughs> okay, does somebody else have a question? Jim? Uh, two quick comments. One, tell me more about the light at 6530 Road in San Juan, because new development up there, the traffic is getting really bad to turn left on there, and when that time period is. And then the other reason is north of my office, when I go north on the left lane, why are the manholes right where your tires are? Why did, Was there a misalignment in the road? Because usually they're in the middle, and every time you hit those, and we're all swerving and trying to avoid those manholes, which you're gonna fix, but why are, in the, why are they in the tire path? <laughs> it's a great question. So the history of pounds and originally, you know, two lane on the eastern side, um, and I don't know exactly how that laid. My guess that is generally the practice. So you you want to put your uh, sewer line either you know on the lane line in the middle or between the tire pass in the middle of the lane itself. Um, that's what we do in all new development. I think the nature of the way pounds have developed, you know, once those sewers are in, they're kind of fixed, you know, because everything ties from every direction. It's it's really hard to move them. Um, so my guess is. With the original Townsend, it was either in the shoulder or um, you know in the center where the turn lane is. But then as as Townsend widened, that's what we're finding. You know we have way older water lines and way more skeletons on the eastern side of Townsend. So I think when it was two lane, that's what it was. You know back in the 50s or whatever. And then as they expanded west, now that got misaligned. And so we're kind of stuck with it. And that's the reason for the project to uh, make them adjustable in the future so that we can stay ahead of it. Um, the signal at 6530. So that. Um, what helped out and rise to the surface, you have these future filings at Bear Creek. You know, housing is going bananas. Um, Bear Creek will probably be built out in the next three years if this holds up. Um, and at that point, the, the warrant is met and CEOP will allow us to put in the signal. So um, probably, I'd say within the next two to three years, we would see that one in. 
Um, we had it budgeted for this year just with these other priorities that got pushed. So yeah. um, it's, it's pretty ripe and I think would happen in the near future. Okay. Um, Dave? Also good to council approval. Just one quick comment. One quick comment. All right. Uh, Scott had mentioned the uh, imminent domain, and just so you know, imminent domain is an option of last resort. We do not use imminent domain as a normal character of our projects, and just to kind of clarify that a little bit. Yeah, knock on wood, we haven't had to yet in my time, 10 years. Um, so generally we're able to work it out, um, but last resort. How many traffic lights does the city of Montrose own? Uh, we just replaced 50% of our signals. <laughs> um, that was a gym project. So that uh, everything on Townsend is owned by CDOT. We still have a financial stake in a lot of them because it's our traffic that's creating um, the loading. But um, the two that the city owned are Nevada and Maine and Park and Maine. And uh, the one in Nevada and Maine, that's Jim's project, but um, uh, got wiped out by a semi. So insurance helped. Do you yeah, got some insurance money? Um, so, uh, Insurance finally came through. Um, helped uh, fund that new signal that you see out there. And the reason the signal went back there is because of the hospital court. Hospital All right, you guys want to give them a round of applause?